Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. And thank you. And uh, thanks, Rosh, for organizing this. And uh, it's an excellent uh, meeting, actually. It was, uh, in fact, engaging for me to learn about how to surveillance these patients, how to diagnose put li li rats and all those things. So now we'll be touching upon current treatment options and challenges in the HCC management. I'll be talking about the options which are available. We have multiple options now. Can say the, I'll just on touching upon the resist and PCLC staging. The basically the latest PCLC staging. I'll be reading about that, uh, trying to explain what is the latest PCLC they say now, and some data on the current treatment options which is already there in outside in the uh, academic world, and the challenges we face now. These are the options which we have already. We have sorafenib, which has been started almost a decade, uh, more than a decade back. Then we came the lenvatinib, cabozatinib, rigorafenib, amiglizumab, nivolumab, grivolumab, and tremilumab has also been added in this, the latest uh, BCLC staging, although the Himalaya trial uh, is still to be validated. And atezobaba is now the actually first line recommended drugs. This is for systematic therapy. From radiology side, we have traced transarterial chemoembolization, transarterial radioembolization, microwave ablation, and radiofrequency ablation. From the surgical side, we have resection and liver transplant. All in all, the best curative therapy always remains the liver transplant. There is no doubt in that. We just remove the root cause of the disease if the patient is deemed okay for trans to undergo a transplant. <clears throat> this is the resist criteria. While we, just the resist criteria is partly uh, the, currently there is a uh, one second. Resist criteria, resist 1.1, uh, modified resist and the easy one. The modified resist and uh, resist 1.1. Basically, complete response is disappearance of all the measurable lesions is complete is uh, resist. Disappearance of all the enhancement is uh, MRS modified resist. And partial, partial response is more than 30% decrease in the sum of greatest one dimensional diameters versus baseline sum of diameters of the target measurable lesions. Similarly, in DM resist, there is a 30% decrease in the sum of uh, uh, greatest uh, one-dimensional diameter of lesion of enhancing component versus the baseline component. Stable disease, any case that does not qualify either for partial response or a progressive disease is uh, stable. Progressive is 20% decrease in the sum of the diameters versus the smallest sum of diameters of the target measurable lesions. In DM resist, there is increase in the viable lesions by more than 20%. These are all those already the present uh, staging systems which are out there. A TNF staging system, the Okoda, CLIP, BCLC, Japanese, QP, and French models. Each of them have variable factors. Commonly worldwide accepted and most often used by the hepatologist is a BCLC staging, which I'll be discussing in the next slides. This was the initial BCLC staging. It was quite simple. They had It had only just Dr. Mithuno saying that it's a, it had a blanket rule. Stage A directly go and have two options, stage A and zero, stage A, B, C, and D. The stages have been kept same, but there are some certain changes which I'll be highlighting in the next slides. Before going to that, uh, the INASL had published its own uh, modified BCLC staging, which had already had this, uh, which had already had this uh, uh, candidate over there. If the patient is kind of suitable for transplant, he can as well undergo transplant in the early stage. This was already published in uh, January 2020 as a modified BCLC staging. Now the, uh, and also the anastasia staging had stage D, which had two, st two stages, that is stage one, D1 and D2. D1 is tumor within the transplant criteria and a good performance status, the patient can undergo transplantation. Stage D2 is patient who has tumor beyond the current transplant criteria and performance status more than two, where we offer best supportive care. These are certain changes made by the inner cell. However, transplantation criteria is very uh, is actually different to each uh, institute. So each one of them has, has their own uh, uh, what is the guidelines which they follow or their exp expanded criteria is different for each of them. Not everyone follows the same criteria and it's very difficult to uh, say that the patient is within the transplant criteria or not. It depends on the institute. This is the latest BCLC staging. Uh, I will be briefly discussing about this. Basically, what they say here is the prognosis of the patient depends upon these factors defined by the alpha phytoprotein. They say more than 1000 is a poor prognostic factor, albi score, child pug score, melt. Presence of variceal bleed in a patient of HCC is also a poor prognostic indicator, though they have not mentioned over here. In the text, they have mentioned that the presence of bleed might also be a poor prognostic factor, but this might not harm the treatment of the patients, and the patient's stage treatment is based upon the stage of the disease. 
So we have the same stages 0, A, B, C, and D. Very early stage is stage 0. There, the, there is a single lesion of less than 2 centimeters and the preserved liver function, a good performance status. The, the candidates is, uh, can be undergo transplant and the portal pressure and bilirubin. Portal pressure more than 10 or bilirubin more than 2. And the patient has no contraindications, he can directly go ahead with transplant, even if the lesion is single lesion. Or the patient is not a candidate for, uh, they are not willing or if there are uh, any hurdles for transplant, then the patient can also undergo ablation. Or if the patient has a good suitable margin, he can, uh, can either undergo ablation or a resection. Meanwhile, they also recommend in here that the patient after undergoing resection, if you find a tumor which there is microsatellite uh, lesions on the resected uh, part or there is any microvascular invasion, then it predicts that the patient might develop recurrence and it is better to offer transplant for these patients. In stage A, we have single lesion of any size or three nodules less than three centimeters, which is nothing but the Milan's. The preserved liver function, the performance status, a good performance status. The patient has single lesion and elevated portal pressures, more than 10 mmHg. Though they say that the 10 mmHg is not a validated cutoff, but they have mentioned it, the 10 mmHg is, uh, uh, as of now, is the recommended cutoff. But similarly, recently, the Bavano says that uh, for uh, NASH patients, the portal pressure, HVPG, may not correlate with the actual uh, decompensation. 10 may not be the appropriate cutoff for them, and further studies are still required for that. The single lesion, elevated portal pressure, high bilirubin, there are no contraindications. Again, you transplant the patient. A single lesion with uh, normal bilirubin and normal pressures, you undergo either resection. And if the patient has less than three, than three nodules, less than three centimeters, there is no contraindication for transplant. Best is to offer a transplant. The patient has uh, three nodules, less than three centimeters, and there are certain contraindications, then you offer ablation. Radio frequency or a microwave ablation depends upon the uh, center availability and the location of the lesion as well. And the survival in these patients is more than five years. The intermediate stage, we have multinodular, that is, which doesn't fit over here, is nothing but the intermediate stage. In this, they are again classified into divided into three types, three stages, B, uh, B. The extended liver transplant criteria, this, as I said before, is dependent on the individual centers. We can, nobody has uniform uh, criteria as well. Uh, after the Milan's, though, even now the BCLC says that the, if there is downstaging to be done, it has to be downstaged to within Milan's. That is, Milan's is the definitive uh, criteria. But if the, the centers have their own extended liver transplant criteria and the size is okay for them and alpha beta protein is less than 2,000, they have less than 1,000, then you can offer transplant for those patients. Or on the other hand, the patient has well-defined nodules but and preserved portal fl flow, but no, uh, and uh, these nodules cannot, they, they say they are not within your extended liver transplant criteria, then you offer taste to them. It is a preserved portal flow. That is the portal vein is patent. There is no portal vein invasion. There is diffuse infiltrative lesion, bilobar, extensive involvement. You cannot offer either trace or transplant. It is better to take them for systemic treatment. For patients who are in B, intermediate, early stages, transplant criteria, probably the survival is better. So for those who undergo trace, is the survival is around two and a half years. And the diffuse extensive involvement, even without a portal vein involvement, may, uh, the survival is only around two years. Then you come out to the stage C, that is similar to the previous BCLC staging, that is portal invasion or the presence of extra hepatic spread with a poor performance, with a preserved liver function and uh, performance status of one to two, you offer systemic treatment. What are the systemic treatments? I'll be talking in the next slides. Uh, that survival is again at more than two years and terminal stage D. Any patient, any what they have specifically maintained everywhere that uh, the patient of stage A according to HCC, but if he has any end-stage liver function or child C status or the patient has other comorbidities which preclude the offering a transplant, then this directly migrate into stage B, where the only treatment is best supportive care. The newer one which they have added here is this one, clinical decision making, clinical decision making and TSM. They are named this as TSM treatment stage migration. It primes lower priority and options due to non-liver related clinical profile. Basically, it's a multidisciplinary team or an individual based therapy in each of these. What they here note is basically if the patient is not suitable for ablation or resection, if the reason is not suitable for any reasons, you can offer TACE. 
we can they have also mentioned that radio emulation transsaccal radio emulation is also suitable for these lesions for lesions less than 8 cm i don't remember the trial name but in the trial they had a median size of 2.5 cm the maximum size up to 8.1 hence they have uh, commented upon tear can be offered for a patient with a single lesion less than 8 cm then if the patient is not visible even for this stage then you will go for the uh, systemic therapy for stage b the patient has undergone this and he is successfully down stage within the milans preferably within milans to offer transplant again for a patient who has this who cannot be offered any other uh, who is not feasible for this as well so again go for uh, systemic chemotherapy as per the nigm im brave trial which will be discussed again by dr bharat in the next uh, few hours uh, it is a very is the first line therapy that they have recommended that is the best therapy and uh, durivalumab and uh, trimilumab they from the himalaya trial only single trial but they say that this might come up to a, a first line therapy in uh, later years hence they have just mentioned it but they are not uh, given a valid recommendation for that if not feasible sorafenib or lenovatinib the, sec the second line drugs again we have sorafenib if the patient is uh, sorafenib tolerant and the disease is progressing we have rigorafenib cabocetinib irrespective of the tolerance to the sorafenib and ramucirumab the efp is more than 400 you offer ramucirumab and if the patient has even despite there is progression after this they say that cabocetinib is a good uh, a third line uh, drug the data and these will be again uh, we just be touching upon the later slides if the patient has still progression after these drugs then you enroll them for the clinical trials if none of them are feasible then you offer a best supportive care this is the latest bclc staging they have also updated bclc one more thing they have added which is nothing but bclc upon progression bclc p which is they have termed it as bclc p there the patient who has a child pug a ctp a performance state good performance status there is radiological progression after treatment the patient was in bclc b or c if the patient has progression that is growth of more than 20% of the existing nodules or a new intrahepatic lesion from bclcb he is within bclcb then we says bclcp that is bclc progression within b the patient is within c then we say bclc progression within c1 but if the patient has developed a new extra hepatic lesions or new vascular invasions then we directly stage them to bclc progression c2 this is a new addition to the new bclc now so basically what we said now we has we had to operation uh, the surgery is the best therapy there is no doubt transplant is the best uh, therapy to be offered 30 to 35% of the waitlisted transplants in europe are hcc usually and expected five year survival rate uh, for patients meeting milans is 65 to 80% liver resections have similar outcomes for patients with small hcc who do not have a clinically significant portal hypertension These are all the available criteria: Milan, UCSF, up to seven tumor and total tumor volume, volume plus uh, alpha fetoprotein, AFP French model, Hangzhou model, Seoul model, and Metro ticket, Asan model. Milan is the one which is uh, validated and probably the best uh, to date. Though there are in center based uh, criteria, I do not want to comment on this. The, uh, basically, Milan is single lesion less than five centimeters or three lesions up to each less than three centimeters with no extra hepatic. Uh, manifestations or no uh, evidence of any macrovascular invasion ucsf on the other hand is single node less than 6.6 or 2 to 3 nodes less than 4.5 cm total uh, diameter of less than 8 cm so on we have many models over here and each center has their own um, models basically but alpha fetoprotein more than 1000 they say it is the patient should not be offered transplant for these patients again as i said these are all the uh, criteria for liver transplantation Yeah, this was the uh, landmark trial for uh, landmark study 48 patients with cirrhosis with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma tumor less than 5 cm or less or uh, with a single lesion or no more than 3 nodules or each less than 3 cm were uh, evaluated were under, underwent transplant the overall mortality rate was 17% after 4 years the actual survival rate was 75% and the rate of recurrence free survival was 83% so single lesion Less than five centimeters, two to three less than uh, three centimeters, and absence of vascular invasion and extra hepatic spread is Milan's. How does uh, alpha fetoprotein affect our uh, treatment uh, modality? Basically, uh, there have been two studies. One, there have been several studies actually. One about the three hundred cutoff, the other about the thousand cutoff. 
This was the study which was published in the American Journal of Transplant in the, almost a decade back. 153 patients with cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. There is progression of alpha beta protein by more than 15 nanograms per ml per month on the waiting list. Yes, the survival is probably only dismissal. Uh, dismal the alpha beta protein, uh, these patients have only post LT recurrence of almost 34 percent. The patient has uh, alpha beta protein less, not uh, increasing, and alpha beta protein more than 300 nanograms. Then the post LT recurrence is 14 percent. So, rate of progression is also important, and the value of alpha beta protein is as well important. Then alpha beta protein less than, uh, these are the studies which say that more than 1000 is an absolute contraindication for transplant. They have high chance of recurrence. Both these studies published in the liver transplant and gastro say that patients who have more than 1000 have a dismal prognosis. Post transplant uh, patients applying AFP within more than 1000 to patients within Milan criteria results in exclusion of 5% and 20% reduction in the post LCHCC recurrence. <laughs> So how to predict, uh, this is, I just want to put, touch upon this important study, uh, how to predict the recurrence of uh, HCC after liver transplant. This is a retreat uh, study. Basically it had alpha phytoprotein at liver transplant, 21 to 99 is one point, 100 to 1000 is two, more than 1000 is three points. With microvascular innovation, presence of is given two points and the largest tumor size plus number of viable lesions, less than five is one, five to 10 is two and more than 10 is three. Based on this, what they have is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and more than 5 scores. The risk of recurrence risk of recurrence increases with the scoring. 0 is less. Up to 4, we have almost nearly less than 10%. And once the score reaches above more than or above 5, the recurrence is very high. The one after that, one year LT as well as the 5 years liver transplant. Local regional therapies. Uh, there are several local therapies which can be offered to these patients. Basically, we, this is, most of them are used as a bridge. Dropout rate of HCC patients on wait list is around 20%, and uh, these local regional therapies can act as a bridge by preventing tumor progression and reducing the probably reducing the biological activity. There are possible oncologic benefits beyond the bridge to transplant. To consider bridging therapy, there should be a wait list of at least six months. This is also holds true in the recent uh, EBCLC guidelines as well. The expanded criteria, if, there is, uh, if, you, if you have expanded criteria, then the patient might go for transplant. If not, downstate the patient to Milan's and then take him for transplant. So what can be used for bridge? SPRT, TACE or RFA. Currently, the BCLC does not recommend SBRT. They have only have TAIR, TACE and RFA. BCLC somehow is skeptical to include, include SBRT and they say that the trials are limited and cannot be benefited. In this study, which was published in the Journal of Hepatology, they said that all of them have similar efficacy. The dropout rate was similar. The patients have actual uh, survival from timing or time of listing was similar in all the patients. So there is no much difference whatever modality you use based on the size or the location. Probably it, uh, it depends on the individual uh, preference and the so location of the size. But obviously, all of them had a similar uh, uh, outcomes in these patients. <laughs> Coming to the drugs which are available, I will be touching upon the oral drugs and not the uh, not much upon the uh, bevacizumab and retuzumab. The first trial which was published in NEGM was in 2008, the SHARP study, in which sorafenib was shown to have a significant uh, median overall survival of 10.7 months versus 7.9 months. This trial has been cited more than 10,000 times in uh, from NEGM. In the Asia Pacific region, they showed that the median overall survival is six and a half months versus 4.2 months. Now, sorafenib is slowly phasing out. I don't know how many of them are using, but we most often prefer, if at all, if the patient requires an oral therapy, we would go out with, with uh, lenotinib. So, lenotinib has approved indications, thyroid cell carcinoma, real cell thyroid, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and endometrial cell CA. These are so the reflex study published in Lancet, where patients were given drugs based on their body weight, 8 mg for less than 60 kilos, 12 mg for more than 60 kilos, and versus compared against sorafenib, what the primary endpoint was overall survival and progression free survival. The median alpha phytoprotein was 133 versus in the 71 sorafenib group. Overall survival, there was significant decrease in the uh, there was hazard ratio. It was non inferiority study basically. So the progression free survival was significantly better 7.4 months versus 3.74 months. Time to progression was 9 months versus 3.7 months. And overall response rate was better in these patients compared to sorafenib. 
Lenartinib has advantages. It can also inhibit potent inhibitor of FGFR4. Though uh, recently I had a discussion that probably that's the only reason that they say that it is probably more effective. Lower dose is required for anti-angiogenesis effect. Lenortinib has a low possibility of drug-drug uh, interactions and less incidence of hand foot mouth syndrome. But a caution of hypertension, hypertension is a little higher with this pay in this drug. It is rapidly absorbed, extensively metabolized, and excreted in the urine. But a single dose of uh, 24 mg reaches a peak plasma concentration within one and a half hours. A terminal half-life half -life is around 24 hours. Hypertension is the common adverse event, hypertension, fatigue, diarrhea. Monitor for hypertension. Hypertension has to be treated. It occurs in around 45% of the patient. That is around nearly alternate patient has developed the hypertension. <clears throat> Control the blood pressure prior to initiation of the drug. Monitor the blood pressure every, every week and then every two weeks after the first two months and then at last monthly thereafter during the treatment. Withhold and regime at reduced dose when hypertension is controlled or permanently discontinued based on the severity. There are some risks of uh, hepatotoxicity. Around 2 to 3 percent can also de develop hepatotoxicity. Monitor liver functions every two weeks for the first two months and at least monthly thereafter during the treatment. So, what they say here, the basic advantage of uh, lenotinib is having FGFR, FGFR4 inhibition. It has significant FGFR1 inhibition, so FGFR1 inhibition more than FGFR4 inhibition in these drugs. Is the tyro only tyrosine kinase inhibitor which has activity against FXR pathway. So this is our uh, study which was published recently as a small letter in one of the journals, Castrohep. Uh, it was the real Indian, first Indian experience, the real world experience. We had around 63 patients who were treated with lenovatinib from the Department of Hepatology. Uh, the most common cause was HB, uh, probably NASH. Uh, viral marker viral, that is HBV and HCV were uh, 31 and uh, NASH was around 28 patients. The maximum diameter was around 6.7 centimeters and baseline alpha beta protein obviously about 1000 in these patients. Portland invasion was noted around 28 percent, child pug A were 28 and 35 with B, BCLC B were 20, 34 and C were 39. There was extra hepatic met noted around uh, nine patients. Some of them had received a prior uh, therapy such as that taste most often was noted in around 20 percent of the patients followed by RFA in around 12 percent of the patients. 62% of the patients were initiated on 8 mg dose and the rest on 12 mg. However, the days, there are a significant number of patients who developed adverse event that is almost 56%. The median tolerated dose in our cohort was 8 mg. So uh, after this, we are now uh, switched to start only with 8 mg. And the patient even uh, does not tolerate 8 mg, we uh, change them to 4 mg. The median duration was four and a half months. Noted hypertension, nausea, and diarrhea, which are commonly noted in other patients, other studies as well. One of the patients as well developed a tumor rupture. Treatment had to be, had to be discontinued around 20% of the patients, and uh, some of them were treated with rigor of enemy, though there was progression of the disease. On Kaplan Meyer analysis, we found that the median progression free survival was five months, and median overall survival was 10.5 uh, 10 10 months, and 52 patients were evaluated with my M resist. None of the patients could achieve complete response. This is the major drawback of all these oral drugs, which might not be true with uh, immunotherapy drugs. 27% <laughs> achieved partial response and 44% had a stable disease, and nearly 30% had progression of the disease. The next, the next drug is rigorafenib. Uh, it is basically a, the resource trial. Rigorafenib should be given in these patients who are tolerant to sorafenib, but who are progressing on sorafenib. If the patient is intolerant to rigor and sorafenib, he cannot tolerate rigor of any as well. Dosing is 160 mg for three weeks followed by a week's gap and then uh, restart the rigor of any at 160 mg. It has a good uh, uh, significant benefit with median overall survival as well as median progression free survival. The next drug, there is uh, similar to the, as I said pre previously, the number of patients who develop complete response is hardly 1%, only two patients. And most of them had a stable disease compared to those who in placebo who could not have a stable disease. So the adverse events noted were hand, foot, mouth syndrome, diarrhea, and fatigue and hypertension, which is common to all these tyrosine and uh, all these drugs. Next is celestial trial that is cabozotinib for previously treated HCC. This, this you can give even if the patient is intolerant to uh, sorafenib. It is a multi-targeted uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor at a dose of 60 mg per day. The overall survival is much better with cabozotinib and medial progression free survival is as well better with cabozotinib compared to placebo. 
the oral, uh, as I said before, the complete response is zero in these patients. Partial response, it is usually a stable disease which can be achieved with these drugs. As again, the side effects are most often diarrhea, uh, loss of appetite, hand, foot, mouth syndrome, fatigue, and nausea. The next drug is uh, Ramucirumab, which is also uh, can be given for patients who are progressing on uh, sorafenib and or uh, intolerant to sorafenib. But in, in this trial, they included a patient who has alpha fetoprotein more than 400 nanograms and child to gain. <clears throat> it was given at 8 mg per kg intravenous every second week. They noted improvement in the median overall survival as well as the progression free survival. Currently, EZL recommends that uh, lenovatinib is non inferior to sorafenib and is also recommended as the first line therapy in patients with well preserved liver functions and who are. Uh, if the patient has still progression, then you can change it to the second line drugs, which are nothing but rigorafenib uh, in the patient who is tolerating and progressing on sorafenib, or cabocetinib and remucirumab who has a patient on, uh, who is progressing on sorafenib or intolerant sorafenib. You all know that the checkmate, uh, that is neolimab, was actually a failure. It, and the p-value could not reach a, a significance of less than 0.05. It, it has a p-value of 0 0.07 and hence probably not recommended in the current guidelines. Coming to a few of the uh, local regional therapies, which I'll be touching upon, is basically contraindication. Most of the patients, most of the students will not be knowing that what are the contraindication for TACE. Related to the liver cirrhosis, a patient with decompensated cirrhosis or presence of jaundice more than two, or a clinical ascites or refractory ascites, HG, epidural syndrome, impaired portal vein blood flow, that is portal vein thrombosis, are contraindications for TACE. HCC, that is related to HCC, extensive tumor involved in the entirety of both uh, lobes or tumoral portal and thrombosis, and technical contraindication of the patient has created more than 2 milligrams because of the use of contrast. Combining taste with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, there has been no uh, benefit as shown in with sorafenib as well as the brevanib. But however, a recent study which was published in Cancer, this trace was combined with lenvatinib versus taste plus sorafenib. There they showed that patients, there are 62 patients, uh, hardly 32, uh, 64 patients, 32 in each group. Participants with previously untreated HCC and PVT were received again uh, taste plus lenotinib versus taste plus sorafenib. After a median follow-up of 16 months, in the lenotinib group had higher uh, treatment time to progression <coughs> compared, to, uh, compared to patients who received sorafenib. And the objective response rate was much better, that so is almost double the, those of the who received sorafenib. On multivariate analysis, taste plus lenotinib was associated with higher uh, time to progression and compared to versus those who received taste plus uh, sorafen. This is the first uh, trial which has shown benefit probably. I am not aware of the other trials. There might be, but uh, this I felt is the latest. Radioambulation versus sorafenib. These are few studies which I could find. Uh, most of them have shown that uh, it is similar recently, but TAIR definitely out uh, uh, the recent trial which has been published. Uh, TAIR definitely has better significant role in these patients who have a uh, Tumor less than eight centimeters and uh, have a portal vein thrombosis with a preserved liver function and absence of uh, uh, portal vein uh, absence of uh, uh, decompensations. There are certain factors. This is commonly used. That's why I put this slide. This, the patient who has uh, failure is most often seen in patients. You should see that patient has good liver functions, and patient who has this, uh, there. If the patient has multiple lesions up to eight to ten centimeters, even then you can offer taste if there is a super uh, super selective taste. And the type of taste, either depth taste or the conventional taste, both have a similar response. But the only advantage of depth taste is the response the tolerance is better. Treatment. Sorry to interrupt. Done. The conclusion: the treatment is there based on the stage of presentation and center and individual based. Uh, there are two terms which have been added, TSM and UTP, untreatable progression and treatment stage migration. TAIR is included, but not SBRT, and strict surveillance plays a major role, uh, important role in all these patients. And with the availability of new drugs, we have a better prognosis for these patients. It's a multidisciplinary team approach. Thank you.